Hi, everybody, and welcome to our third panel, our STEM panel. This is for science, technology, engineering, and math colleges. Um, we hope you are enjoying our panel series. This is uh, Laura Kazan, and I'm here with Becca Stewart-Orlowski, and we are hopefully getting better at this. Um, today, we have six fantastic colleges that are here to speak to you about their programs. And of course, we will follow with the question and answer afterwards. For those who are viewing us on YouTube, if you look down, you will see that you can subscribe to the channel to see the next time a panel comes up so that you can watch. You can also um, join us on the link so that you can be part of future panels. So just look down. You can see that you have the ability to sign up. Um, we're going to get started right away with our very first college, WPI, and, um, and here we go. Thank you for joining us. And Perfect. So I think I'm unmuted, so if people can't hear me, just message in the chat box just so I know. Um, but my name is Tyler Gibbs. I'm an assistant director of admission here um, at WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute um, in Massachusetts. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, I'll talk briefly about where we are located in the state. Um, so we're located in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, which if you have any idea what the geography of Massachusetts looks like, we're right in the middle of the state, about 50 minutes west of the city of Boston. Um, we're located in a city, a city of about 180,000, 200,000 residents, or about 38,000 or so are actually college students. So looking at this photo, it's looking towards downtown Worcester. You can see the brick buildings clustered in the middle. That's, that's WPI. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, just some key um, numbers and statistics to throw at you before I wanna dive into my main point here. Um, so here at WPI, we have about 4,500 undergraduate students and about 2,000 grad level students. Um, we have 50 different degree programs, everything ranging from 12 different engineering programs to computer science, game design, business, um, we also have the more traditional science and math programs. So if you want to study biology, physics, chemistry, actuarial mathematics, you have the opportunity to do that. Um, here you also have the opportunity to double major and minor because so many of our programs do overlap. It's fairly easy um, to do that and something your advisor can help map out. Then you can see the four and five year um, BSMS programs. So here at WPI, students have their opportunity to complete their undergrad and master's in five years. Um, we currently have 18 programs where you can do that. And we are also in the process of creating um, undergrad and master's programs that you can complete in just four years. Uh, my sister actually goes to WPI um, and she'll be graduating this May with both her undergrad and her master's in just four years. So it's something that I know can definitely be done. Um, and just our way to try to make college, you know, a little more affordable and so you can get more out of that experience. Um, and then a number we're most proud of before I dive into what really makes WPI WPI is we have a 95% freshman to sophomore retention rate. So that means 95% of the first year students that moved in on campus fall 2018, returned fall 2019 for their sophomore year. Um, so hopefully through the rest of this presentation, you can see why we think this number is so high. So if you go to the next slide, this is kind of the bulk of what I wanna talk about. Um, so here at WPI, we do things a little differently. Um, we center all of our teaching around this thing called the WPI plan. Um, it was created back um, in 1970, we're ce celebrating the 50th anniversary this year. Um, and it's truly what makes WPI WPI and what makes WPI different from a lot of other schools. Um, and so there are four different components that I'm gonna talk about with you all today. Um, so if you go to the next slide, the first thing is our academic calendar, which is pretty unique. Um, so here at WPI, instead of semesters, we actually have four terms. Each term is seven weeks and students only take three classes during each term. Now each term, it's not abridged. Students are covering the same material in a seven week term as they would in a 15 or 16 week semester like most other schools, um, but it's a faster pace. Um, so instead of students meeting once or twice a week like they would at a semester based school, students are meeting four or five times a week to cover that same exact amount of material. So it's the same number of class hours, um, but they'll be meeting in class for calculus Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, for example, um, to cover that same material. And like I mentioned, students are only taking three classes at a time. So instead of balancing four or five classes a semester, students only have three classes to focus in on. So that's only three projects to work on, three tests to study for, three professors to get to know every seven weeks. Um, and the nice thing about the way this calendar is set up, you can kind of see the breakdown um, throughout the academic year. And in between each term, students have a nice break. So between A and B term, 
Students have 10 days off in the middle of October. They would have just taken finals for their first three courses. Then they have 10 days off. They come back and they start another fresh set of three courses. Then they have seven weeks. They come back um, and then they take their finals. Um, and then they have a month off for winter break, just like any other school. They come back for their next seven weeks. They have another fresh set of three courses. Then they have their spring break, which they're currently on. And then students will come back for their last seven weeks and end the first week of May and then start back up the last week of August. So it still runs like a normal academic um, calendar length from um, the end of August to the beginning of May. So students have a good three and a half months off over the summer to intern, travel, um, take courses during our optional E-term. I mean, as you can see, we creatively named our, our terms A, B, C, and D, so it's pretty easy to remember. The second component of this WPI plan I want to chat a bit about is our grading policy. So here at WPI, you can receive one of four grades, an A, a B, a C, what we call a no record. And what a no record refers to is if a student's going to get below a C in a course, um, so below a 70, instead of receiving a D or an F, the student will receive an NR. Now, what this NR means is it's not going to show up on your transcript. It doesn't affect a student's GPA. It's basically like it never happened. And there are a couple reasons why we design it this way. Um, one, we want students to challenge themselves. We want them to push themselves outside their comfort zone to take courses that they necessarily wouldn't have taken before. So whether that be a higher level course or a course outside of their main focus, just to see if it's something they're interested in. And if for some reason that just doesn't go well for them, they can fall back on that NR and it won't affect the GPA that they've worked so hard to build up. Um, and just because we have this policy, it's not used a lot by our students. Our average NR rate over four years per student is 0.6. So STEM students either are not NRing or they're only NRing one class during their time here at WPI. Now look at the grades. When I mentioned A, B, and C, there are no pluses and minuses. An A is an A, a B is a B, and a C is a C. And the reason we do that is to cut out the competitiveness that comes um, with STEM-based schools. Um, as I'll talk about in just a bit, our students do a lot of team-based projects and want to make sure students are encouraged to work collaboratively instead of um, competitively. And then the third component before I touch on the last one is we have an extremely flexible curriculum here at WPI. We don't tell students, you know, if you want to study mechanical engineering, here are the 45 classes you need to take in order to graduate with an ME degree. We give students a list of categories of courses to fulfill. And within each category, students will, might have to do you know, five courses in that category to fulfill it, but students will have a list larger than that to choose from to really mold their degree into what they want it to be. And so basically no two students with the same major will have the same looking course um, selections. And um, that's great because it allows students to you know, prepare themselves for whatever it is they want to do when they graduate from WPI. Now, if you flip to the next slide, I'll talk about the fourth component and that's our project-based curriculum. So here at WPI, um, we have a lot of projects and every single one of um, students' classes will be doing some degree of project and team-based work. And there are a couple of uh, larger scale projects that students are required to complete in order to graduate. Um, and I'm gonna talk about two of them just because of time. The first one, that IQP, the um, Interactive Qualifying Project, that's the student's junior year project. Um, students complete that their junior year. Um, and it's an interdisciplinary project. So students will work in teams of three to four students um, with different majors. Um, and this is supposed to be a, more of a social science project where students are going to take what they've learned, learning to become scientists, engineers, and mathematicians to try to apply to um, a larger project facing the world. Now, this is when students typically choose to study abroad during their time at WPI. Um, about 70% of students will leave campus to complete this project, and they can go to one of our 50 different project centers all around the world to complete it. And when they go abroad, they go to one of these 50 different project centers with their group of WPI students, and they are essentially working a nine to five internship for the entire seven week term they're abroad, um, working on this project and solving the problem. And then the senior year project, the MQP, the major qualifying project is completed student senior year. Now this project um, is major specific. You can kind of think of it as the senior capstone. It's what students um, complete their senior year um, in a team of three to four students of similar like majors to their own um, to show, hey, I've learned something during my four years or three and a half years here at WPI. Um, so to give you a couple of quick examples for this MQP, um, uh, one of my students who just graduated, Travis was um, or is an RBE a robotics engineering major and his team um, built an autonomous sailboat that entered a race hosted yearly by the US Navy um, to compete autonomous sailboats and they actually won the competition. So it could be something 
uh, similar to that. Um, and students really have control over what that is. If you go to the next slide, I mentioned those are broad opportunities. So we have 50 different project centers all around the world, as you can see there. Um, and I talk about these large scale projects. These projects are, are built into the curriculum and they count as three courses. So students have to complete them and it's a whole term's worth of work. So when students go abroad for one term junior year, that's, that's a whole term's worth of work. So they're not delaying any timeline. It's built into their curriculum. And then students senior year, they usually spread it out over the entire year because a senior year project should take time. Um, and talking a bit about abroad, a um, every student at WPI when they're admitted are awarded up to a $5,000 global stipend to put towards their abroad experience to encourage students to take advantage of leaving campus. And then just my last slide, just to talk on um, results here at WPI. Um, here at WPI, well over 90% of our students are either employed or in grad school six months after graduation. And you can see the average starting salary for the class of 2018s right there. The, the, the survey was just released for the class of 2019, so the class that just graduated and their average salary was $72,000. So um, our students are, are pretty successful after um, they graduate from WPI and a lot of that has to do with the WPI plan, you know, learning to work in a fast paced environment, um, learning to collaborate and work in projects. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions, you know, after everyone presents, but that's a bit um, about WPI. So I'll hand it over to whoever is presenting next. Hi everyone, I'm not sure if you can see me, but I started my video. My name is Lori Calloway. I am the regionally based assistant director of admission at CU Boulder for SoCal. So what that means is I live and work in Southern California um, and I'm responsible for Southern California full time. Um, with um, Boulder, even though this is a focused discussion on options for STEM interested students, I'm not starting there because to start there would be to misunderstand what we do and how we um, bring value to this area. So we are happy with our name and we take it quite literally on campus. I, students will be really challenging themselves to look at their studies in a more bold, more dynamic way than just following sort of a prescribed curriculum. Next slide. Um, the, a great example of this is one of our current seniors. So she is in what's called TAM, Technology, Arts, and Media. So that's a major in the School of Engineering. It's definitely a STEM major. Um, but TAM is an interdisciplinary major. So this student it has three areas of focus. She has taken a media studies curriculum, she's taken a dance curriculum, and she's taken a mechanical engineering curriculum. In her major, in her thesis, what she has done for graduation is she is working on a project where she has choreographed um, a dance uh, performance of 12 people, um, putting meaning into it from her media studies uh, curriculum, and she has fully built and programmed the movement responsive LED costumes that the dancers are wearing to bring greater meaning to the dance while they're doing it. So next slide. So that is really how we support STEM students at Boulder. This is a very customizable uh, option for students who want to bring their full selves to study STEM. So if you want to be an aerospace engineering major, but you're also thinking about how much you really enjoyed poli sci, that's a major and that's a minor. And that's something that our School of Engineering is incredibly favorable towards because they want their engineering students to be thinking like the most competitive new hires that we see in the space at the moment, which is people who not only are really technically gifted, but people who work collaboratively, do research, um, have great writing skills, great powers of communication. So our whole STEM offering really supports that ethos. So we have many, many different ways you can customize what you do at Boulder. We, uh, for example, if you're interested in environmentalism, we have about five or six different majors that you can take that will approach that with different levels of rigor in terms of how science and math based they are. And we really want our students to take advantage of the fact, sorry, by the way, um, having unmuted means all my email notifications come through and I'm getting a bunch today. Um, but we want our students to be able to pursue their full scientific selves without locking themselves away from other types of information or education. Next slide. 
We really heavily encourage students to consider applying into Boulder through the program in exploratory studies. Uh, now, about 25% of our first year students start off in PES. Now, because we have so many different options, over 150 different customizable pathways based upon what you are really interested in, that can be an overwhelming amount of information for an applicant. So when we have students who are truly undecided and may have multi-interests and not are not sure where they want to fall, this is the best way to apply, even if you're a STEM interested student. This will give you the chance to work with advisors on campus who are specifically trained to help you figure out what of our offerings are best for you and how to structure it and how to get um, experience in different class areas to be sure of your choice. Um, and related to this, but not PES, is if you're really truly interested in our School of Engineering, but you're not sure what type of engineering, it's still okay to be undecided. You can apply into the School of Engineering as an undecided student and go through similar advising like a program and exploratory study student does, but specific to the engineering options. And you will be able to choose with um, an informed choice based upon what you uh, have been exposed to in that first year and both students in the program in exploratory studies, um, which can help them access any STEM major on campus and specifically in the engineering and decided program uh, do have four year graduation rates. Next slide. Um, we also really want students to seek balance in what they do. So a lot of our area is heavily favorable to research, especially natural sciences research. Um, but also because we are uh, in an, a, a city and close to a larger city, a lot of our students in the social sciences as well have lots of access to research um, and also to populations to study or to do case studies on. So that's something that they can definitely take advantage of. But beyond just using our area for um, research and using some of the natural opportunities around us to enhance your studies, we really want students to seek balance in what they do at Boulder, um, both with what they do inside of the classroom and outside of the classroom. Um, an overall cultural norm on our campus is to seek that balance and to constantly be trying to find a way to um, really answer the question of what, I'm, what is what I'm doing? How is it helping my overall life? Not just um, am I achieving a goal, but what type of life do I want to live and how is what I'm doing helping me get to that life? Um, and then just also being located in such a central area really helps for research funding. So um, beyond just the outdoor activities that are in our area, we're the second largest NASA funded public school in the country, specifically because we're in some of the densest concentrations of aerospace industry in the country. So while it is beautiful and very outdoorsy, it's also very, um, uh, has a heavy concentration of startup funding, has a lot of big companies around and a lot of tech companies. So um, beyond just getting out and seeking that balance, you can also really seek a strong resume. Next slide. Now we understand that coming to a large state school as an out of state student, um, it may seem a little bit more confusing price wise because uh, there's a difference between in-state student tuition and out-of-state student tuition. So we, especially with students who are looking into STEM careers, which might require them to do more um, outside of class research time or internships, which can come with an additional cost, which we actually do help them with. Um, we also have a tuition guarantee for students coming in. And what's really important for STEM students is that we are constantly working on reducing fees. Um, most often fees will be seen in lab fees. So we have actually, for example, last year we reduced um, our lab fees for our engineering students slightly. So while the costs will be fixed, there is a chance that your fees, especially if you are in a lab heavy program, may go down. Next slide. Now, our average overall entrance salary is really reflective of, I think, the resumes that our students come out with. Um, we, the, so this is the average across all of our majors. So social science majors, natural science majors, uh, in addition to our School of Engineering, which people tend to think of us first for when they're thinking about high power careers or STEM or science. So we have such a strong um, 
a starting salary and a minimum career salary because we are really preparing our students, especially the ones who are entering into more regimented programs like STEM programs um, with the skills that make them successful in their career. And that is not just um, can you look through the scope and diagnose what's on the other end of the slide. It is what do you like to work with? Can you write a grant? Can you um, build a team of four to work on this project? So those sort of interpersonal and more business skills are something that we really want our students to have a lot of experience and exposure to as an undergraduate through their internships, through working in labs with professors, and it's really shown to pay off for our students as they have graduated and entered the workforce because they're very, very hireable and then they're very, very promotable. Um, Last, and this is my last slide, but I just wanted to really just summarize with all of Boulder does. We are a top 65 research university. A lot of people think of us for STEM, but what I really want to emphasize is that we teach in the liberal arts manner. So that means that um, you're not going to be getting the a regimented curriculum that I think a lot of people expect from a large state school. Where we really try to excel is giving our students access to have this be a collaborative, interactive four-year process where they're creating the educational experience that they really are looking for. And that makes them more competitive when they graduate because they're not like every other bio major, every other chem major who's come out into the workforce that year. They're very specific to their interests and they are, they're better at describing what their point of view is and um, really explaining what they bring in value to employers and also to grad programs. So thanks for the time and that is it for me. Hi everyone, uh, this is Will from the Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, as you can see uh, from the photo in front of you, um, you might recognize the skyline. Um, we are located in Chicago, um, and this is a nice little view of our campus. It's a relatively compact, um, uh, easy to get around type of place um, where our students call home. Um, they get to sort of use this as a, a home base and then travel up on the train that you can see uh, there in the photo just uh, about a five to seven minute trip and they'll be right in the center of uh, downtown Chicago. So if you wanna go to the next slide. Uh, this is a little bit more information about sort of where we are in relation to other things uh, in Chicago. So if you're somebody who has been there and you're familiar, you probably know the Willis Tower, uh, maybe the Navy Pier, uh, and definitely probably know our airports. Um, so you can see our campus is located just a few minutes outside of the, the center. Um, it's a pretty, um, pretty quick and easy trip. Um, like I mentioned, about five to seven minutes on either the green or red line uh, to get you right downtown. But our campus itself is actually situated just between two two uh, neighborhoods. We have historic Bronzeville um, and then Bridgeport. Um, and so the campus being sort of in between the two of those, um, sitting right on the um, sort of the, uh, the place where the former meatpacking industry was housed, um, gives us sort of an interesting location where you get a lot more green space and uh, it feels almost a little bit more suburban uh, than being right downtown in the center of the city. You can see there it says we are only uh, just under a mile from a beach. Um, so while you can't use it uh, a lot of the year in Chicago due to winter, um, it is there um, and it's always uh, kind of nice to grab a bike. Um, and then there's a really cool bike trail that runs all the way up and down uh, Lake Michigan there. Next slide. Um, at IIT, we really specialize in the STEM fields. Um, so we are uh, very STEM focused um, and we offer currently um, just over 35 uh, undergraduate degrees um, and they're split amongst uh, currently six colleges. We're really excited um, in the next year, we'll actually be um, adding a seventh uh, college to the university. So our College of Science um, will be merging um, and, and sort of changing a little bit um, with the Lewis College and then um, we will actually be having a standalone College of Computing uh, that's coming online next year. Um, so that's going to be a pretty exciting time on campus. All of our CS degrees as well as our information technology management degrees will be moving over to that College of Computing. Uh, in addition to those majors, we offer um, uh, plenty of minors for students, uh, things like artificial intelligence that you would you know, expect at a STEM school, uh, but we also offer music, um, we offer history, literature, some of those um, more liberal arts um, types of programs. And then we do have special programs, things like pre-med, pre-pharmacy. Um, some of those are direct admissions programs, so you can actually secure a spot as a high school senior um, in, uh, into a, a professional program. Uh, next slide for me, please. 
Awesome. So at IIT, um, we really have three sort of big ideas about our university that we always want to make sure we share. Um, one of them is being Chicago's only STEM focused university. There's a lot of great schools in Chicago, um, and we definitely encourage you to explore all of them. Uh, but we happen to be the only one who's solely STEM focused. Um, and that really dates back um, to uh, quite, quite a, a number of years, 125, uh, just over 125. Um, and so our, our professors and our students have a lot of great opportunity in the city because of this. Um, one of the things that, that we have is uh, the National Research Laboratories. Um, there's uh, one that we helped build. Um, it is a proton ring facility. Um, so for anyone who's interested in physics, uh, we do some really cool imaging based uh, work there. Um, and we also work around that ring uh, with a number of other universities from the area. Being in a city like Chicago also gives us a lot of opportunities for uh, internships, off-campus experiences, um, for you know, some of our um, engineering and NCS students. There's obviously lots of traditional businesses. Boeing has um, a headquarters. Um, we have lots and lots of headquarters in Chicago. Um, we also see a lot of small startups, um, and that's another thing Chicago uh, has uh, definitely an advantage with. Um, other thing you'll find is because of all of the museums and cultural organizations, our students get to do some sort of interesting and different experiences, things like human computer interaction studies. Um, that's definitely something uh, a lot of our digital humanities students explore. Um, and then we try to take advantage of that relationship with the city as well. Um, the building you see here is an example of that kind of collaboration with the city of Chicago. Um, this is our newest building. Uh, it's been open uh, just about eight months. Um, so still bright uh, and shiny and new. Um, not quite as shiny as in this photo, uh, but it does have a slight glowing effect um, just from the way it was built. But it's home to our innovation and tech entrepreneurship programming, uh, which a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, some of the things that you'll find inside that building uh, is uh, our um, iPro uh, program, which is similar to some of the, the presentation um, that you've heard from other institutions. You'll also find um, our Elevate program, uh, which is solely focused on getting students off campus. We want you to do study abroad. We want you to do internships. And we understand that there's usually a financial component to doing that. And so Elevate helps you find them, uh, but most importantly helps you fund those off-campus opportunities. I apologize, I live by an airport, so if you hear that, um, you're, you're hearing the, the planes leaving uh, where I live. But um, other things that you could do with your research or with your Elevate um, is also help to fund undergraduate research. We do that as early as your first year on campus for students. Um, so we really encourage folks to uh, get involved in, in that. And just a few sort of examples there on the slides. Um, one thing we have is our Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. That's research that's um, coordinated with our College of Architecture. So even things you might not necessarily think of when you think of research, business, architecture, um, that's also available at IIT. Next up. Um, and last, we want to talk about IIT really being an engine of opportunity. Um, we're really known uh, for providing upward mobility for students. Um, we're known for, um, you know, having a pretty, uh, pretty low cost. Um, we do our best to try and provide uh, as much funding as, as possible to students. Um, and uh, that really helps our students have some really great success upon graduation. Um, really good return on investment numbers, um, really good sort of uh, that best value um, when you look at us uh, in terms of a ranking. Um, and that all stems from the things that our students are doing, um, having career services that are available to help students, um, helping them with major specific work, um, you know, doing large career fairs to get students on campus. All of that really contributes to that success success that we see our students having. Um, and then if you have questions about scholarships, know that we do everything from about 10 to 15,000 per year up to full tuition scholarships. This year we awarded close to 65 uh, full tuition scholarships for our incoming students. Um, so that definitely helps to, to lower that cost a bit. And then I think the next slide is just my contact info if I'm correct. Oh no, already, next slide there, thanks. Okay, can you all hear me now? <laughs> I started without the muting on. Anyways, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you all are. First of all, thank you so much to Laura and Becca for hosting us all this today um, and gathering to share a little bit about all of our institutions. So my name is Annalise and I am an admissions officer at Colorado School of Mines. Colorado School of Mines, we are located in Golden, Colorado, which is about 30 minutes west of Denver. Uh, and so a little bit about, next slide please, a little bit about who we are in our campus. So we have about 49 
1,200 undergraduate students and about 1,200 graduate students with a 92% first year retention rate. So as a STEM focused institution, all of our academic programs are related to those fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. And with a retention rate of about 92%, that indicates that the first years had a positive first year experience and they are excited to come back for that second year. And generally the 8% that transfer after their first year are individuals that realize that STEM is not their calling. And as a STEM focused institution, it would be challenging to continue if that were the case. Next slide, please. And so within that academic setting during your first year, the average class size is about 34 students and we have a 16 to one student faculty ratio. And these numbers alongside our undergraduate student population of about 4,900 indicate that the learning environment at Mines is more individualized where you are not gonna walk into a chemistry class of 500 students where you are just a number. Rather the professors, they will know you by name and they will know your goals and your objectives. And most importantly, you're able to build and foster of those relationships with them over your tenure at Mines. And then within our undergrad population, we have about 30% women. And this is pretty reflective in terms of engineering as an entire industry goes, but we are really proud to host the largest section of the Society of Women Engineers in the nation on campus, which is a professional organization. They host weekly lunch and learns, various professional development workshops over the course of the academic year, as well as a handful of K-12 outreach programs. Next slide, please. And so a little bit about academics. Uh, so as I mentioned, we are a STEM focused institution um, and we offer 37 undergraduate majors. And at first glance, looking at these list of majors, there are not 37 items listed there. So how we get to that number is within a variety of our programs, such as civil engineering or computer science, there are a handful of emphasis or specialties that our students can choose from, getting them up to 37 undergraduate programs. And as a student at Mainz, you don't have to officially declare your major until the end of your second year. So those first few semesters on campus, all new students are taking the core curriculum. And during this time, having an opportunity to meet with professors and students of different disciplines to learn a little bit more about those areas that you may be interested in. And those core classes, those are all taught by teaching faculty. And so these faculty members are not doing any outside research and are 100% there for the students in the class time. And then as your curriculum becomes more major specific, then those courses will be taught by research faculty who are both experts in their industry as well as expert teachers in the classroom. And then students who are admitted to Minds are admitted to all of our academic programs. So on that first year application, the students will select their intended major, but if they end up changing their mind when they get to campus, that is totally fine. They do not need to reapply to another program. And another thing to emphasize is that our majors are never capped at a certain number. So there will always be space for them given the interest at the time. Next slide, please. And as a student at Minds, we really value coupling that classroom experience with real world applications. And that starts as early as the student's first year. All new students are enrolled in a course called Cornerstone Intro to Design. And the objective of Cornerstone is that it gets the student starting to think and work like an engineer, where they will be problem solving, collaborating, and working on a team throughout the course of the semester. And then after they declare their major, generally that second year, then they'll be enrolled in their field session, which is a three to six week in the field experience where they would be doing as a civil engineer would do or as a computer scientist would do for that period of time. So the objective is not only a month's intensive hands-on experience, but it also gives them a glimpse into what their career after mines could look like. And then if they're looking to gain some undergraduate research as a student at Mines, we offer a plethora of undergraduate oppor research opportunities. And then within the Mines culture, it's really common if you hear of a professor working on a certain project that piques your interest for the students to request to be a research assistant in the lab. And a lot of times those positions are also financially compensated, which is an advantage for our students as well. And then finally, their senior year is rounded out with the senior capstone project. And this is similar to a senior thesis, but again, building on those skills from intro to design, well, they will be on a team of about six to eight other students in their major and working on a real world problem presented to them either by a campus lab or a program client, which is a company that has a strong affinity with mines, such as Shell or the US Olympic Committee, to name a few. Next slide, please. 
So a little bit about our application process. A quick disclaimer, things are subject to change. So I will share how the cycle went this past year and in years past. Um, but definitely if you're a student is a sophomore or first year um, or even a junior, just double check that summer before there is cycle um, to ensure that this information is up to date or to get any updates that have happened. Um, so as of right now, we operate on rolling admissions. So what that means is once our application is live and available, then we start receiving complete and submitted applications. And as we are receiving those applications, we are reviewing them and giving out decisions as the semester progresses. So come fall 2020, we will be actively filling that fall 2021 class. Um, so a big piece of advice is to get that application in early. And so what goes into an application at Minds? So we require that online application, which can only be found on our website. And there's also no fee to apply for first year students. We are not a member of the Common App as well. And then we require your official high school transcript. So for homeschool students, that is your transcripts sent um, from, your, from your parent or guardian to us, um, whether that's through snail mail or email, either way works, well, uh, works for our process. Um, and then beyond the online application, we also require your official or self-reported SAT and or ACT scores. And so on that online application, there's a portion where you can select your unintended major or your, you can type in your, uh, I'm, pardon me, your official or your, un <laughs> you can type in your scores, SAT and or ACT scores, and that is all we need for admissions purposes. And then a part of the enrollment process, so saying, yes, I will be there in fall 2021, part of that process is sending over your official score report from College Board, making sure that we're holding our applicants accountable for the scores that they reported throughout the cycle. And so to give you an idea of what a successful applicant's academic record looks like, at the top of the slide reflects a current first year class when they went through the application cycle. So for those SAT and ACT composites, those are by no means minimums or maximums. 25% of our admitted students who have scores higher and 25% of our admitted students have scores lower than what's reported there. And then when we were looking at your transcript, we want to see that you've taken the most rigorous classes and found opportunities um, whether it's through your homeschool or taking concurrent enrollment that have challenged you in an academic setting. And we are considering, considering uh, your unweighted GPA too throughout the application review. And so a few tips for you all. Um, so considering that rolling admissions, definitely applying early. So regardless of when the student gets their admissions decision, it is non-binding. So they have until May 1 to commit to mines, apply to other schools, weigh financial aid packages, whatever it is that goes into their decision making, they have plenty of time to process that. And then we encourage our applicants to stay engaged. If you have the opportunity to come out and visit us, uh, we highly encourage it, though you can stay engaged with us through webinars such as this, sending us emails, giving us phone calls, because we love to build that rapport with our applicants over the course of the cycle. And then on that online application, there is an optional personal statement. However, I highly, highly encourage that you write something there, because it is a really great opportunity for the applicant to tell us a little bit more about themselves and to add a little bit of personality and character to their application. And then finally, letters of rec are also optional within our process, uh, but often recommended if there's something that needs a little bit of explanation from an adult figure in their life, and a letter of rec is a really great way to convey that message. Next slide, please. And as the students, as you are starting to envision what your college career will look like, I also encourage you to think about what an institution will provide for you in terms of networking and job prospects. So at the Colorado School of Mines, the average starting salary for the class of 2018 was about 69,000. We are ranked number one public university in the West for the highest salary 10 years out and number eight return on investment in the nation and number one best valued institution here in the state of Colorado. And so every year, the Career Center, they put on the largest job fair in Colorado twice a year. Uh, we have uh, twice a year in each event, we have over 300 recruiters looking for mines employees, everyone from a first year intern to a full time graduating senior. And so about 78% of our students have had at least one internship during their time at Mines. And then the final stat to leave you all with is a class of 2018 had an 88% positive outcome. And so what that means is within three months of graduating from Mines, 88% of the graduates were either in a job related to their major or in a graduate program continuing and furthering the education. Um, so I'm happy to answer any other questions we have after the, you all have after the presentation. Um, thank you so much for the time again. Hi everyone, 
can everyone hear me? I'm having some technical difficulties today. So I don't have a recording. I'm just going to be voiced. So if you, if you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, I'm Ashlyn. I'm from Rose Holman Institute of Technology. We're located in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, if we can go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so a little bit of an overview about Rose Holman. Like I said, we're in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, we are about four hours south of Chicago. If you can't hear me, sorry. We are about four hours south of Chicago, um, about one hour uh, west of Indianapolis. Can anyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, so we are a private STEM college. Um, unlike and similar to some of the other schools you've heard from, we um, we don't have any other majors outside of science, engineering, and mathematics. We have about um, 2,000 undergraduates um, on our campus and about 100 graduate students at any given time. Um, so we're very much so an undergraduate um, a focused school here at Rose Holman. Um, like I said, we're a STEM only school, so we're pretty well known for our engineering majors. Um, mechanical engineering, computer science, um, biomedical engineering are all really popular programs here. Um, but we still have majors in the math and science areas as well. Um, so if you're just looking for that you know, straight math or straight science degree, you can get those here at Rose Holman um, too. And because we're undergraduate focused, um, our freshmen starting out have access to all of our labs and um, start in hands-on projects right, right away. Nothing is off limits for our students here at Rose, you know, from the get-go. So you don't have to be a graduate student or an upperclassman to get access to start doing research or start doing internships or get into some of those upper level labs um, on campus. And some of your classes will either, even start out in those. Um, kind of the kind of student we're looking for here at Rose is a kind of as a self-starter, um, driven to excel in STEM and motivated. And we're looking for that kind of student because we are on a quarter-based system here. Um, so we have three main academic quarters, one in the fall, um, one in the winter and one in the spring, and then we have an optional summer quarter. Um, because the classes are a little bit more fast paced than that traditional um, semester based calendar, um, the students really have to be motivated to stay on top um, because with the 10 weeks of quarters, uh, the classes go by a lot faster. You're still taking four to five classes at a time. Um, sometimes you may only take three, sometimes maybe four, but you have to be on top. So we're looking for those kind of self-starter students who are going to be successful here at Rose Hallman. Um, all students will do a lot of project-based work. They um, all do a senior capstone project um, during their senior year and present it to um, faculty, staff, and companies who come in the spring. And about 80% of our students will graduate in four years, which is fairly high for um, typically engineering majors. We can go ahead and head to the next slide now. Um, I won't spend too much slide on, time on this slide, but these are a few of our accolades I want to highlight. Um, we have been very well known for our undergraduate engineering programs in the past, like I mentioned before. Um, we have been ranked the number one engineering college for the past 21 years in a row. Um, the other thing I like to highlight is that our um, chemical, civil, computer, electrical, and mechanical engineering programs have all been ranked number one as well. So we're very proud of these accomplishments and we always strive to provide the world's best undergraduate STEM education and produce graduates who will face um, complex societal problems and be leaders in STEM in the future. Um, if we can go ahead to the next slide now. So our, our faculty and our, our is really something that I think helps us stand apart. Um, in general, we have 19 STEM majors, over 20 STEM minors, um, but we do focus on humanities as well. So you're not getting out of those type of courses here at Rose. You're still required to take um, at least nine humanities classes, but you can choose throughout those 15 areas that we have. Um, something that's a little bit different about Rose is we are a teaching school um, versus being a research-focused school. And that just means that our professors are hired to be educators as their number one priority. Um, they're not hired to do research and then teach on the side. They're hired to be teachers and most of them still do research. It's just not why they're here. So we find that we're hiring professors who really want to be here, that really want to work with our students and are passionate about our students. 
Um, and so all of our classes are taught by faculty members. We don't have grad students or teaching assistants teaching those courses. So you really get to know your professors here at Rose. Um, they'll know you, you know, because our, our class size is fairly small, you know, average class size around 20 students. They'll know your name, they'll know who you are, and they'll be expecting you in class. Um, but on the other, other end of things, um, you know, you can go to your professors when you have questions. We have an open door policy, so you don't have to make appointments to meet with your faculty members. Um, after class, you can just pop in and ask questions if you need to, and they're really the greatest resource on our campus to get help when you need it. We know that a Rose-Hulman education can be challenging, um, but the professors are here really 100% for our students. Um, and another thing, uh, backing up a bit about our, um, our, our STEM programs in general, um, when you're admitted to Rose-Hulman, you're admitted to all of our majors. So um, we don't have separate uh, schools. You're, when you're admitted to Rose-Hulman, you're admitted to all of our programs. So you don't have to um, be admitted into any specific program to start in it. Um, if you at any point you want to change your major, you can just change it. Um, you don't have to go through any reapplying process. So it makes it very flexible to, to change your major because when you're admitted to Rose, you're admitted to all of our programs. Um, we'll go ahead to the next slide now. Um, changing gears a little bit, um, but I think this is something that makes Rose, you know, pretty unique because we are such a small school with only about 2,000 students. I think it's easy to think that maybe um, our offerings for students outside of the classroom are smaller as well, but they really aren't. Um, of course, we have over 90 um, student clubs and organizations, um, but we also have 20 NCAA uh, Division three sports teams, and we just got news today that we're adding um, lacrosse in a few years. So that's exciting, both men's and women's. Um, so not everything outside the classroom is STEM, fo STEM focused too, though you can get involved with our innovation center centers um, um, with our academic competition team. So if you're into robotics or cars or um, we have a concrete canoe team. There's all kinds of unique things happening down in our innovation center if you want to use what you're learning in the classroom um, outside with an activity. Um, we also have Greek life. About 35% of our students will be involved in Greek life. And then we have um, quite a few professional organizations um, that you can get involved with. So um, professional fraternities, um, Society of Women, Women Engineers, NSBE, um, SACE, and then we have uh, other programs like Engineers Without Borders that you can use, again, what you're learning in the classroom outside. So I always like to highlight what we have offering um, for students because, you know, we really try um, to have everything that a bigger school would, even though we're on a much smaller scale. And we can go to the next slide now. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about this because this is um, one of my favorite things to talk about with students and their families. Um, it, because our career services department is just awesome. So when you, when you come to campus, you get two advisors. You get an academic advisor and a career advisor. So your academic advisor is a faculty member within your major, but then you also have a career advisor, which is a staff member, and these two advisors will follow you all four years. So as a freshman, you'll start meeting with your career advisor, um, and they'll start prepping you to go to the career fair. You'll start working on resumes. Um, because actually about 35% of our freshmen will have an internship um, at some, you know, during that freshman year, right after that freshman year. Um, about 94% of students will complete at least one internship, and about 70% of students will complete two internships. Um, and this could also be a co-op or a research experience as well, I should say that. Um, all of our internships, co-ops, and research experiences are paid opportunities. Um, and these opportunities are all over the country, so they're not just here in the Midwest. But, you know, we have students going um, East Coast, West Coast, down to Texas, all over the place to complete these internships and co-ops. Um, I have one student who's a tour guide for me, and he just left last week um, because last week was our quarter break, and he's headed to Marathon to do a, a co-op all spring and all summer quarter. Um, so many times that's kind of what our co-ops will, will look like here on campus. Um, Throughout the school year, we bring about 350 companies to campus for one of our three career fairs. And again, these companies are coming from all over the country. Um, and about typically about 60% of our seniors will um, have a job offer before they even start their senior year. So they're doing these internships and co-ops throughout the, 
throughout their years here at Rosen and then come in their senior year with really something already in hand. Um, typically, our placement rate within six months after graduation is anywhere from 97 to 98%. And I think this is really uh, unique as well because this, uh, this percentage is not just based on a survey we send out to our graduating seniors. It's actually based on our career service department talking to every single student who graduates to come up with that um, percentage. So we're really proud of that. And we know that almost all of our students are you know, in a career or um, gone on to grad school. So that, if you're thinking grad school, that's something we can send you to, or you could go to Rose Holman for grad school or go on. As you see, about 20% of our students will go directly into a graduate school. Um, we also send students to professional schools like med school, law school, business school. Um, that's definitely an option out of Rose Holman and something that happens um, quite often. Um, and kind of finish it out, um, our average starting salary um, in 2019 was um, just right at 73,000. So we're really, we're really proud of that number. Um, some are, you know, if you're looking at computer science or something like that, some of those averages are even higher than that number. Um, but I think a lot of that is attributed to the education that they're getting here at Rose and then the experiences they're getting with internships and careers and research opportunities while they're on campus. Um, I don't know if we have any uh, like sophomores or juniors, but I just wanted to make a quick note. I didn't have a slide about this, but we do have summer um, programs for students. Um, if you are you know, freshman, sophomore, junior, you know, looking for something to do this summer, we have some um, engineering and science overnight camps on campus. So if you have questions about that, you can ask me afterwards. Thank you. All right. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're from. Uh, my name is Dave Hernandez. I'm Assistant Director of Admissions at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in beautiful Prescott, Arizona. Uh, and as that name would apply, aeronautical, there's a big focus to our campus. And yes, a big part of it is aviation aerospace related, but really, we might as well be called Embry-Riddle Polytechnic University. Because when you look at our list of degrees, and we will, what you're going to find is we are a STEM-focused university. And when you combine that with the fact that we focus on the undergrad, that turns into pretty incredible outcomes for our graduates, as you're going to see. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we're located in beautiful Prescott, Arizona. It's not what most people expect when they think of Arizona. As you can see, there is green in Arizona. There, there are, there's forest in Arizona. Um, we're up in Prescott. You notice I'm pronouncing it Prescott, not Prescott. That's how we say it here locally. It's a beautiful part of Arizona. We're about a mile high in elevation, so roughly the same elevation as Denver. So because of that, we get lots of sunshine, but not the extreme temperatures uh, in the summertime. And in the wintertime, we don't get the extreme cold either. So one of the things I like about Prescott is any given day during the winter, you can say to yourself, I'm going to, you know, I want to go snow skiing. So I'm going to go up to Flagstaff, hour and a half drive or so. Or same day, no, I'm going to go get a tan, hour and a half to Phoenix. Uh, it's a big elevation difference. Uh, next slide, please. So just a few fast facts. We're about 3,000 students on our campus. Um, of that, about 40 or so are graduates. So really the focus is the undergrad. So we're a private nonprofit co-ed residential campus, dorms, dining halls, athletics, scholarships, internships, all the, you get that college experience, that, that campus life. Students from all 50 states and from all over the world. Average class size is about 25 students, legitimately so. Uh, my son is a sophomore right now. And um, freshman year, all of his classes, with one exception, all of his classes were between 15 to 25 students. Um, so pretty phenomenal class sizes, very hands-on. We'll talk more about that. Uh, but over 200 plus clubs, intramural sports, varsity sports, clubs like ballroom dancing, skydiving, Quidditch, and, and on and on. You, you get a nice variety here. So you get that full college experience. Next slide, please. So Embry-Riddle, it's a world-class STEM university. Uh, just a few accolades among many that we could give. Um, we've been ranked number one in aerospace in our in, in, uh, engineering in our category for 19 consecutive years by US News and World Report. The overall College of Engineering, we have aerospace, computer, electrical, mechanical, and software engineering, has been ranked consistently in the top 10 to 20, depending on the year, by US News and World Report. Um, 
we're the largest supplier of college graduates to Boeing, the world's largest aerospace company. Uh, they're one of many uh, STEM-focused companies that recruit heavily in our campus, and we'll see more of those later. Uh, our observatory on our campus was ranked in the top 10 of all college observatories in the nation. Um, so phenomenal. Um, so far, through our forensic biology degree, we have 100% medical acceptance, medical school acceptance rate to date. Uh, so pretty phenomenal degree there. Uh, Embry-Riddle, our two campuses combined, I should mention, we have an Arizona campus and a Daytona Beach campus. Uh, so together, they've won 13 collegiate flight national championships. 12 of those are the Prescott campus. So pretty phenomenal for that. That's just one of many things that we do, as you're going to see. And a, a very neat aspect of our campus, the College of Security Intelligence, first and only one of its kind in the nation. Uh, the faculty in this college are literally former CIA, Secret Service, FBI, military intelligence, law enforcement. The students in these degrees are literally getting internships, top secret clearances, and job offers from places many times they can't tell me where they're going. Uh, so these are not your typical just criminal justice degrees. Next slide, please. So outcomes is another awesome aspect of why I love working at Embry-Riddle. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention I'm a homeschool dad myself, homeschool father of six, so very proud of my son here. Uh, but we have a 97% employment rate across all of our degrees. So if we break that down, 94% are employed in their degree field within a year of graduation. 3% go to graduate school. Now, some people look at that 3% with concern and say, how come only 3% go to grad school? That doesn't sound very good. Well, it's just that 94% are getting hired by places like Boeing, NASA, Lockheed, SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, CIA, FBI, and those organizations will pay for your grad school as you work for them. So those of our students that do go to grad school get into the, some of the finest in the country. We've got a graduate right now uh, at uh, Harvard in their astrophysics master's degree. They ranked her number one in their incoming class in, of the entire nation. Uh, we've got a graduate at Georgetown Law School. Um, so those that go to grad school get into the finest in the country. It's just that overwhelmingly, they're getting hired by world-class institutions without a grad degree uh, and then having the company pay for it. So our campus here in Prescott ranks in the top 1% of return on investment of all U.S. universities. So very high starting salaries. And we were very honored that Time Magazine years ago called us the Harvard of the skies. That's a nice compliment. I'll take that. A lot of reasons for that. Next slide, please. So how do we achieve all those accolades? Next slide. It, we treat undergrads like grad students. So uh, like many of the schools that you heard from here today, the hands-on begins freshman year, first semester. Um, they're, they're using state-of-the-art labs. We have five wind tunnels. One of them is supersonic. It goes up to Mach 3.5. Robotics labs, propulsion labs, materials labs, space systems labs, electron microscopes, 3D printers. Everything that I just said and more is strictly for the undergrad. Uh, we don't have graduate students for the vast majority of our degrees. 100% um, of your classes and labs are taught by professors, and not just professors, but professors with real-world experience in their field. They've worked at Boeing, they've worked at NASA, they've worked in the CIA. So they're teaching from experience, and they know the students by name. Um, and our, our, our curriculums for undergrads are graduate level, and I say that because we take a lot of the general eds out, and we replace them with substance related to their major, substance that at many other schools are graduate level courses. You're doing a lot of graduate level work as an undergrad here. Uh, so internships, a study abroad opportunities galore. Uh, we've got a young lady right now graduating this May. She did seven internships. She's got six job offers before her junior year of, of college was over. Uh, many students like that. So extensive undergraduate research on this campus, especially in engineering, the fact that we don't have grad students for most of our degrees means the undergrads are doing all of the research and they're doing very high level research. Uh, and that leads to those awesome outcomes. Next slide, please. So this is our full list of degrees. As you can see, we've only got a little over 20. That 97% employment rate is across the board. All of them are in the high 90 percentile range. Some of them, like cyber intelligence and security and forensic accounting, have been 100% since the program's inception. But all of these are fully accredited bachelors of science um, in the high 90 percentile range average across the board. So if we have a degree in it, we're good at it. Um, and as you can see, we're very STEM focused, doing a lot more than just flying. The flight degree is the first one, aeronautical science. Um, but if we have a degree in it, it's a very high employment rate going to companies all over the country and all over the world. Next slide, please. And this is where our graduates are going. This is just a sample. So it's one thing 
to have a 97% employment rate, and, and that in itself is great. Um, but it's another thing to have a 97% employment, employment rate with organizations like you see here. And this is just a sample. Um, so all of these companies and many more are physically on our campus here up in the mountains of Arizona every year, recruiting our students for internships and jobs. So one of my uh, greatest um, joys working here, students that I've admitted are now working in these places and giving me tours of where they work. And it puts the same smile on my face that they had when they came and toured our campus for the first time. And as you can see, this is a who's who of the STEM world, especially in aerospace, but not limited to that. And again, this is just a sample. There's many more uh, companies out there that do recruit. We just can't list them all here. Um, just a few comments as, as I close. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a homeschool dad. We're very homeschool friendly university. From an admission standpoint, we're very holistic. We look at the whole person. Um, uh, on the transcripts, you know, whatever you submit as a homeschooler, we consider official. We do accept dual credit. Uh, we do accept um, CLEP and things of that nature. Um, the only difference for a homeschooler in, the, in our admissions process is we cannot accept letters of recommendation from a parent. So I know many homeschoolers are, are part of homeschool co-ops. I know my kids are. So that's the only exception. Otherwise, we don't treat you any differently. Uh, from a public school student, uh, you don't have to submit samples of your co coursework or anything like that. Um, we, too, like some of the other schools here today, have rolling admissions. But we do recommend that you apply sooner than later, uh, especially from a scholarship perspective. Um, we are not on the Common App. We're a very unique university. Um, we like to say at Ember-Riddle, it really is rocket science. Um, so um, I believe I'm the last school, so uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions here in the Q&A time. Thank you so much for your time and for considering Ember-Riddle. It's an honor to be considered amongst the other schools here today. So thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, presenting. This has been wonderful. Um, Laura, can everyone hear me? This is Becca now. So. I'm not going to go on video, but can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so I think, um, David, I'm going to pull you off, and then Laura, how can I get on just so it, okay, perfect. All right, so um, I'm going to go through some of the questions um, that I've compiled, and so you guys can post them in there right now, and, and everyone that you can see their contact information, so please make a note, take your notes, and write this down. Um, so if you have further questions for any of the representatives, um, there's their contact information. This is fabulous. You guys were all amazing. Um, I'm going to ask some school specific and some general, so I'm going to go back and forth here. So uh, one of the questions we got asked, uh, I think Embry-Riddle answered, um, but maybe the rest of you can answer. What, uh, what specific things do you want to see from homeschoolers? Are there specific admissions? I think WPI answered Embry Riddle, so maybe we could hear from uh, Rose Holman, Illinois Tech, Mines, and Boulder. Could you just briefly maybe answer, you know, it doesn't matter who answers, but you know, is there anything specific that we need to know as homeschoolers? Um, this is this is Lori from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, with our program and process, there isn't anything different that we need to see from homeschool students. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that um, for homeschool students to be competitive for merit scholarships, their whomever, and that can be the parent, um, whomever is in charge of writing their transcript should add appropriate weight for courses that are weighted if they are weighted. Um, if a GPA is not provided on the transcript and, and or if the courses that could be weighted aren't weighted, um, we will assign a student a GPA um, and that usually won't make them uh, competitive for merit scholarships. We, if a, if a homeschool student's parent or whomever does the transcript writes the transcript out, puts down the GPA and weights the GPA if, if appropriate, then we will take that GPA and we will use that for scholarships versus the standard GPA that we would assign to a homeschool student. Great. This is Anneli speaking from Colorado School of Mines. Um, so similar to the other institutions, there's nothing different really about the application process. Um, we are with that transcript all we need is the parents or guardians to send that to us from them um, and it just cannot come from the student. 
but otherwise the application process is the same and they're considered in the same way that all students are. Okay. And Illinois Tech. And this is Will from Illinois Tech. Um, so yeah, we um, are very similar. Um, the application process is standard for everyone. Um, you just submit your official application and then we, we do require official test scores. We unfortunately are not at, at self-reporting just yet, um, but you um, can submit that. Um, if a GPA is unweighted, um, our review team does um, add appropriate weight depending upon how the courses are transcribed. So make sure you indicate um, honors, AP, that kind of stuff. Perfect. Uh, and then did we miss someone? Did we get everyone? I, yeah, this is Ashlyn from Rose Hall. Yes, I, Ashlyn. I don't have anything additional to add. Um, we're pretty standard as well. The only thing we run into occasionally with homeschooled students is that we just need to make sure that a recommendation letter is written by someone other than a parent. Uh, for all of you guys, I've heard you say that. Um, so what I've always recommended, especially for the schools on the Common App, is that parents are writing the counselor letter, but then they get teacher letters outside letters of recommendation. Um, is that okay? Yep, that's okay. perfect. Okay. That works. Okay. All right. Um, okay, thank you so much. Next questions I've got here. Um, what classes do high school homeschoolers uh, need to take to stand out in STEM college applications? Probably, you know, like what, you know, what level of say math or sciences or anything else that you guys can comment on? Uh, yeah, um, so Lori. Um, so this is something I see that's not just specific to homeschool students. So I'm really glad this question is coming out. If you're applying to a program that's ranked as highly as our engineering program or similar programs, you really want to make sure that you're taking, and I know this seems obvious, four years of science, including physics. Um, so chem, bio, physics, and a fourth. And then you really want to make sure that you're working your way through four years of math that includes pre-calculus and hopefully calculus. Um, because without those, that can preclude you from being competitive for a lot of programs. Great. I assume the answers to everyone else is the same. <laughs> exactly. I would yeah. echo, echo that. Yeah. yeah. I would completely agree with that. Okay. So for all you listening, you know, basically get through calculus one, um, if, do your very best and take a lot of, uh, you know, science, take your basic sciences. And, and of course they would probably love it if you even went beyond that, if you, you know, if, if your kids, but, uh, will kids, um, are they going to be disadvantaged, say, if they stop at Calculus 1, or is that pretty much where most of the students that are applying to your institutions get to? So for here at WPI, um, something like 75% of students who start at WPI complete at least Calc 1 by the time they graduate high school. Um, so we definitely see students who go above that for sure. Um, we always encourage that, but something specifically for students who are homeschooling, it's always great to see students who are you know, taking courses um, that, you know, aren't self-paced. So if they're able to take courses at a local community college or state school, that's always really great to see um, because of the, our unique term system here. It's very fast paced and we want to make sure students, you know, have that experience in the, in a traditional college setting because here there's really no wiggle room for time and not to say that, you know, students who are homeschooled can't do it, but it's always great to see that on a, on a transcript when we're reviewing homeschool students. Yeah, that makes sense. So real time, real experience in a basically in a college classroom beforehand because your pacing is so quick. I think that exactly. was Rose Holman and WPI are on the quarter systems. Okay, great. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. And how about this uh, next question? Are there any of your universities that focus on coding and artificial intelligence? Do any of you guys have those as majors? Embry Riddle does. Okay. Um, we have software engineering, computer engineering, cyber intelligence, and security. We also have a degree called simulation science, games, and animation, which is the one my son is in. And a big part of that is artificial intelligence, virtual reality. Um, so that degree is designed to allow you to go to a gaming uh, company or go work in animation in Hollywood. Some of our faculty have done that. Um, so we do have those, yes. Okay. 
This is, oh, go for it, go for it. <laughs> Thank you. This is Annalise from Colorado School of Mines. Uh, so similar to Embry Riddle, within our computer science department, we have five specialties that students can choose from, um, one of which being computer engineering or robotics and intelligence systems. So there's definitely an interest. And then beyond the classroom as well, there are student organizations um, that have a focus on coding. So if the student is looking to get that from an academic outlet or through extracurriculars, there is certainly a way for them to achieve that goal. Um, at Boulder, we uh, offer opportunities to get involved in all of those areas, um, but students should really ask questions without assuming what name of major they think will cover it. For example, our media production major is where you want to be if you want to work in electronic music production or graphic design or using VR to in, in a gaming, like in a, in a computer gaming creation way, separate from our computer uh, engineering major or our um, computer and electrical engineering major, which is like hardware and software. Um, we are working on research in artificial intelligence and we have an amazing VR and XR program that's actually being used very widely by students across majors. Um, this program is very open to basically their ethos is the first VR therapy hasn't been created, the first VR movie hasn't been created, so we're looking for people to come in and take these technologies and apply it to their areas of interest and create in that space. Um, so that, and we have a similar ethos with artificial intelligence. So there's less to extend that to more creative pursuits and that's a lot more technical. And then um, just to, oh, at uh, Illinois Tech, we, uh, we do have a standalone artificial intelligence major um, that will be part of that new college of computing that I mentioned. Um, so that is something that we have um, in addition to uh, a number of different computer science related programs as well. Similarly to what's already been discussed at WPI, you know, we have traditional computer science that can take you a number of different ways from artificial intelligence to cybersecurity to machine learning. But um, as been discussed, uh, programming is intertwined in a number of our different majors, including our um, interactive media and game development program, as well as our industrial engineering, which looks at processes to our robotics engineering program. So there are a number of different ways to kind of get that experience, depending on what you're looking to apply it to in a future career. Um, and go ahead. Rose uh -huh. Hilton, we're very similar to WPI with those. Um, we don't have specific AI programs or majors, but we do offer courses in them. Um, but we, you know, like like WPI said, we have computer science, software engineering, um, and computer engineering majors. Excellent. Uh, quick question for WPI, but probably for the others as well. Um, WPI, you mentioned that homeschoolers should, uh, you encourage them to interview, um, are, is that alumni or video if kids can't get it? Because we're California homeschoolers here, you know, and so if they can't get across the country to campus, yeah, so if you're, you know, homeschool, we travel as staff in the fall, and that's when we do a lot of interviews. So I'm the one who travels to Southern California, um, and I go all over, and I spend about nearly a month between LA and um, San Diego, and we have someone else that does the rest of the state, and we schedule interviews. Um, and if students can't get to campus, which is <laughs> fair, um, or they can't meet with us while we're on the road, we can um, work something out um, okay. but though on the road it's always done by a staff member and if you come to campus it's either by one of us staff members or one of our um, student associates in the office uh, do any of you other schools require um, interviews or highly recommend them This is Colorado School of Mines, Annalise, and we do not offer interviews. Um, however, if you are able to come to a campus visit, you can informally just chat with one of the admissions staff, um, and we'd be happy to answer any additional questions that you all have, but no formal interviews. Okay, great. And, and we're riddle no formal interviews here, but and likewise, we encourage you to come visit the campus. Okay. Rose Holman? Yep, we're pretty much the same, no interviews, um, but we do take into consideration demonstrated interests. So, um, you know, coming, if, you, if we're at your high school visiting with us, or well, not your high school, your homeschooled, sorry. Um, you know, when we're in the area, if you come to information sessions, um, or if you get the chance to come to campus meeting with an admissions counselor one-on-one, -on -one, but again, it's very informal. Gotcha. And I think Illinois Tech doesn't have interviews. 
Correct. I would echo um, very similar uh, to those who don't have interviews, but um, encourage, you know, visit to campus if possible. Okay, great. Um, do any of you offer fire protection engineering courses? Um, so here at WPI, we offer, we're one of three schools or so that offers fire protection engineering as a master's degree. So students who are looking to pursue fire protection engineering usually come to WPI and study um, mechanical, civil, architectural, electrical, um, aerospace engineering, and then move on for a fifth year in fire protection. And then they'll graduate in five years with their undergrad in whatever major plus a degree in fire protection. I highly rec recommend students if it's something they're interested in pursuing and not really sure what they want to do, looking into it because there's way more demand for employees in that field than there are people who are trained in doing it. Um, and they make a lot of money. Um, so I definitely recommend you checking out um, schools that offer programs like that if it's something you're interested in. Okay. Anyone else fire protection? Every Riddle doesn't have any fire protection degrees per se, uh, but literally this week we're hosting a, uh, a firefighting conference, uh, for, especially for forest fires. Um, you know, th those do happen in Arizona, California, of course, as we all know. Uh, so very supportive of that community in particular, um, but no formal degrees in that. All right. And at Colorado School of Mines, there are no, no degrees either in the fire engineering realm. Okay. Um, anyone else? We're good to go. Okay. So it's a pretty, it sounds like it's more of a graduate level type thing um, and there might be some undergraduate courses. Um, some quick questions about, uh, any of you, uh, foreign language, do you require that in high school? And if so, you know, how many years would you like to see? Same with humanities, say, um, uh, what do we say, history? Just typical high school requirements, a couple years of foreign language? Yeah, at, at Boulder, and I think um, the, and this is Boulder's public, so we're bound by um, uh, Colorado's version of the eighth through G's. Um, okay. But they operate a little bit differently in that generally students have to complete those areas of expertise or areas of proficiency by the time they graduate college. So what happens is we do require to meet that language requirement, three years of single language, three years of ge um, geography, which can be social science, social studies, um, three and four years of English, as well as the math and the science. Um, but if, for example, a student has done two of French and one of Spanish, then one on campus, they'll have to complete uh, the third year of French sometime before they graduate. So it's not, um, if you don't meet all of those areas for us, it's not immediately being precluded, but we do want to see a student who's academically challenging themselves every semester. This is Annalise from Colorado School of Mines. So as long as a student is meeting their high school graduation requirements, they are generally um, meeting what we are looking for in a applicant. But one thing to note is that since we are a STEM focused institution, we are definitely looking for students who have demonstrated an infinity towards STEM. And in the classroom environment, that could be through taking rigorous STEM courses, um, four years of that math in sciences, um, and so that's just something to keep in mind. But when it comes to the humanities and foreign languages, as long as they're meeting their high school requirements, it will be good on our side. All right. Um, at Illinois Tech, no foreign language requirements for us. Um, not something uh, that, that we look at. We actually don't offer foreign languages on campus either, just as a warning if that's something you're looking for. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Um, so at WPI, just, we just require whatever is required of the, the high school that the students or the state they're applying from. We don't look for anything specific. Okay, great. At Embry-Riddle, we do not have any foreign language requirements to, end, to be admitted to the university. Um, for, uh, for our intelligence degrees, especially global security intelligence studies, um, you have to take 12 credit hours of at least one language. The four that we have on campus is Arabic, Chinese, Spanish, and Russian, Mandarin Chinese, um, all of interest to the intelligence community. Uh, and then if you wanna do a language other than that, you can, you can uh, the faculty can help you find an approved off-campus foreign language. Uh, but other than, than the in intelligence degrees, uh, no requirement on campus or to be admitted. And this okay. is Ashlyn from Rose. Um, we do not require any foreign language courses in high school, um, but we do offer foreign language here on campus. We offer Spanish, German, and Japanese. Um, so students can take that here. 
And really the only course requirements we have is that students have to have taken biology, chemistry, and physics in high school. Okay. So that answer somebody was asking, um, you know, say somebody did a lot of a lot of physics and math but didn't take biology. It sounds like you all are saying get some experience in a biological science, um, even if it's not, you know, the, a strength. If somebody's focused on another area, um, find a way to get some exposure, yeah? For Embry-Riddle, we require at least two years of a lab science, and it can be any combination of them. But yeah, if you're going to do engineering, definitely recommend physics. Uh, if you're going to do forensic biology, we recommend obviously doing some sort of biology. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. And a, a bold. Oh, go for it. Well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I would say we're very similar um, uh, to Embry Riddles. Um, uh, we require two years, um, but obviously anything additional would be great. Okay. And Boulder. Um, we, if you're really interested in a STEM major specific engineering, we really need to see physics, um, and we need to see our physics, four years of science, and three of natural. So you, as long as you do one year of physics, you can do like two of physics, one chem, one bio, or two of bio and one physics, or two of chem and one physics, but um, keep four years of science, physics, and then however you range it between the other two. You know, if you take two chem and no bio and one physics, and then in environmental science or something like that, you can do that. And and I would probably say for anybody, because we're going to run out of time here, if for anybody who has questions, reach out to all of them. So if you're not sure about your kids' curriculum, you know, definitely reach out um, to them. Okay, so I just want to get through one of the, do, 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 one of the questions I've got is, and, and this is going to be a, I, we're going to have to do a short answer, but um, kids, students with disabilities, um, female students, how do you ret retain them? And then students who are homeschooled but have artificially low standardized tests due to disabilities or whatever. So that's a mouthful, but we have five minutes yeah. left till noon. So disabled students, retaining female students, and low test scores. So <laughs> Go. quickly here at WPI, we're test optional. Um, we don't factor um, SATs into scholarships, so don't feel pressured to submit SAT or ACT scores. Um, students... Um, with different accessibility, our Office of Accessibility Services works with students to um, get the accommodations they need. Um, and that's something if you're admitted to WPI and decide to enroll, you'd go through a process to get those accessibilities. Um, and then in regards to female students, um, we, it's very important for us to have a diverse student body. And it's interesting here at WPI, yes, we're about 60% um, male, 40% female. But when you're on campus, you'd think uh, we were majority female. They run most organizations here on campus. And it's great having a female president um, with a focus on hiring um, female professors and um, uh, female staff members to give those um, role models for female students. Um, there's programming. Our Office of Multicultural Affairs works with um, our female students with um, specific programming and resources there as well. My sister's been here for four years, absolutely has loved it. Um, so, you know, she, I guess, is, is proof of that. But I guess that's my quick answer. Awesome. This is Annalise from Colorado School of Mines. So in regards to the test score, so they are a required part of the application process. Uh, but this goes back to that optional personal statement and having an opportunity to share where your strengths are as a student. Um, and it would also be recommended to them to take, uh, to request some letters of recommendation to um, bolster your application a little bit more. Uh, but then with all applicants, we do take a holistic approach, meaning that we are considering the applicant as an individual, everything from how they've spent their time out of the classroom, their academic interests. Um, and so the test scores is just one little piece of that bigger puzzle. When it comes to retaining women students on campus, so as I mentioned, we have the largest section of the Society of Women Engineers in the nation, which is a really great opportunity for students uh, to find that community um, and that professional development. And then there's also Greek life that the student chooses to become involved in Greek life. Um, but we find that our female students actually graduate at a higher rate um, and have stronger GPAs than their male counterparts. So uh, that's pretty awesome. And we're really proud of that. Um, yeah, uh, over here at Boulder, um, we, in our engineering department, we have about, our male to female ratio is about 45% female students to 55% male students. Um, we uh, have made gender parity in our School of Engineering um, 
uh, an overt recruitment goal for the last 15 years. Um, so it's something that we are very, very focused on. Um, similar to Colorado Schools of Mines, our uh, Women in Engineering chapter is recognized as one of the most active in the country as well. Um, and the reason why I mention it specifically for School of Engineering is because a lot of our other STEM majors are spread out across our other schools that are at 50% um, parity or actually more represented uh, by women. Uh, so, um, and with, for students with disabilities, our Office of Disability Services will work with you before you even enroll as a student while you're still a prospective student in your senior year to help you transition your accommodations plan so that if you enroll and walk onto campus, you will be ready with accommodations that first class. Great. Uh, yeah, I would, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I would just say I would echo um, what others had said, um, said there. Um, for us, uh, the test scores, you would want to definitely sh uh, share those, but then also share um, a little context for us. Is this um, Illinois? This is Illinois. Oh, yeah, sorry about okay. that. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. I just want to make sure they're, they're hearing that. Go ahead. Um, and then um, for disability services at Illinois Tech, it's very personalized. Um, like Boulder, you could start working with them as an applicant um, to, to get started um, and, and to make sure that you have a good experience at IIT. Uh, and then uh, with uh, women uh, at IIT, our Dean of Engineering uh, is currently uh, a woman. And so we have a lot of outreach efforts, um, a lot of support uh, built in uh, because of the faculty support that comes uh, with the institution. But I'll be, be quick there and brief. All right, here at Embry-Riddle, um, so we are test optional. So if you have good test scores, by all means, submit them. We also super score. So we'll take your best test scores and we accept SAT or ACT either or, there's no preference. Um, but if, if, you're, if you're not good at standardized tests, you can opt out at the, at the, uh, when you apply and we will not wait for those to come in. Uh, otherwise we're very holistic, we look at the whole person. Um, regarding uh, women and females in support, so we have a Women's and Diversity Center on campus, uh, which specifically uh, addresses uh, retention, uh, academic support, uh, for the ladies on the campus. Um, so they do great work. Um, our, our, our chancellor of our campus, uh, Dr. Carlson, is female. She's a very accomplished engineer with a lot of uh, impressive uh, accolades and accomplishments to her name. Um, for, for students with disabilities, we have uh, the Disability Services Office, and they help with all sorts of accommodations. Um, for students, we had a, a young man graduated a couple of years ago, engineering completely blind. Uh, so between the, the disability services office and just the fact that our professors know you by name, the professors themselves are going to give you one-on-one -on -one tutoring here. Um, you get get a lot of personal attention. We want to see you succeed. There's no weed out classes here. Um, so uh, additionally for females, there's all sorts of organizations on campus, Society of Women Engineers, Women in Aviation International, uh, and many more. So a, a lot of support for, for females here on the Prescott campus. And this is Ashlyn and I'll, I'll keep this quick because many have touched on things that are similar to Rose. Um, but we do have an uh, student success, accessibility um, office, sorry, I can't say that very well today. Um, and, and Patty Eaton, our director, will work through every student from the beginning um, with any um, disability that they may have and work through whatever um, plan you need to put in place. And you would meet with Patty when you got to campus as well. So if you need additional testing time or uh, private testing or anything, you know, ad like that, um, she's the one you would work with and it would start now. Um, as far as test scores go, we, we do have a holistic review process, but if you're not meeting our minimums, um, I would highly encourage, um, you know, writing something in addition additional information portion of the common application to let us know. Um, I've had students submit, you know, doctor's notes or um, counselor notes or something maybe as to why you just can't quite get those test scores where they need to be. Um, and then keeping uh, a female on campus, um, we, our percentage of females are quite a bit lower than some of the other schools. Um, we're about 25% female on campus, but um, when I have visitors here, I've had them tell me, you know, you don't even notice it when you're here on campus. It seems very even. Um, and, and some of the resources we have for those girls um, would be um, some of the, you know, female um, focused clubs and activities on campus that would uh, run through our um, diversity student office. So um, SWE, as many have mentioned, um, you know, Greek life for female students. We have three sororities on campus. Um, and, and honestly, um, about 50% of our faculty are female. 
So I think, you know, the women that those girls are looking up to can be a great resource for them. Great. Is that everyone? Did we get everyone? I think so. We've got WPI, Mines, Boulder. Yes. Okay. Um, unfortunately, it is, um, it is noon and I don't want to keep everybody late. We did not get to all the questions. For those of you that did not get your questions answered, please reach out to these amazing, wonderful admissions representatives. I think this has been my Sorry, Laura, but I think this has been my favorite session so far. Um, this has just been wonderful. Um, uh, Laura, if you have any final words to wrap it up, um, we can do so now. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming. And this is, of course, Becca's favorite because she's a STEM person and I'm the alternative education person. So we, um, we have our favorite panels. But this has been great. I really appreciate everyone um, uh, coming and giving us your time and speaking to our families. Um, for the families, most of you are still on here, expect a, um, a survey coming. We really want your feedback on what we can do well, what we, can, what we did right, what we can improve. Um, and please reach out. You can see that everyone's information is on here. And um, I think everyone would be happy to hear from you if you have more questions that were not able to be answered in our session. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, families, parents, students. Um, and um, all of our representatives. It was really appreciated. This will be on YouTube shortly, so keep your eyes open. And I think that concludes our session. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, have a great day.